Well, good evening to all of you, and welcome to a very special night here at the Naval Academy. Tonight, each of us will have the opportunity to honor and reflect on the service, work, thoughts, and words of a distinguished naval officer, a great American, Vice Admiral James Stockdale. Admiral Stockdale is a 1947 graduate of this institution who served for 37 years on active duty. Most of those years were as a carrier-based fighter pilot. Ten of those years were associated with the conflict in Southeast Asia. Admiral Stockdale was shot down flying an F-8 Crusader as the carrier air group commander over North Vietnam in 1965, spent the ensuing seven and a half years as a prisoner of war, the senior naval service POW. For his heroic actions during that time, he was awarded the Congressional Medal of Honor. After his return from Southeast Asia and his promotion to Admiral, he served as the president of our Naval War College in Newport. During that time, he instituted a course on ethics, a course that we modeled our course here at the Naval Academy after. Admiral Stockdale retired from active duty in 1982 as a result of his wounds from Vietnam. He then became an educator and a scholar. And we're all as rich for that service as we were for his heroic service in uniform. And talking to his lovely wife, Sybil, tonight, all of his four sons, their four sons, are now in the education business. That's also a wonderful legacy, Admiral. Tonight, we get to honor this very special man and to reflect on his thoughts, words, and service. I'll now introduce Dr. Pierce, who will give us the format for the evening. But before I do, I'd ask you to join me in another warm welcome for Vice Admiral and Mrs. James B. Stockdale. Thank you, Admiral Ryan. It's indeed a privilege and a pleasure for the Center for the Study of Professional Military Ethics to have as the second in our lecture series, Vice Admiral Stockdale. We're going to do something a little bit untraditional this evening, and I will walk you through the sequence of events. We're going to begin with a videotape documentary that the Stockdales kindly lent us, which runs about 20 minutes. I had the chance to see it uh, the other day, and I think it does a marvelous job of setting the context for the time and the place in which this man and his brother POWs served with such distinction. After the videotape, I will introduce in sequence two of his brother POWs who will offer some reflections on the theme for this evening which is Moral Courage, an evening in honor of Vice Admiral James B. Stockdale. After they have had a chance to offer their reflections, Admiral Stockdale and I will come to the stage and seat, sit on these two chairs here, and we will have what he and I call a conversation. And we will draw upon some of the issues that are important to him, some of the questions that came from midshipmen who are now taking NE203, and from some of the faculty and staff who teach that. That's the sequence of events, and uh, we'll begin with the videotape. 
Thank you very much. We knew them as American prisoners of war. But to the North Vietnamese, they were war criminals. Many were tortured, and some died there of malnutrition. But few were treated more harshly than this man. Admiral James Bond Stockdale was a POW in Hanoi for seven and a half years. Some say he was the most tortured American in captivity. He spent over four years in an isolated cell in leg irons, where his captors twisted and broke his already broken leg. Years later, Admiral Stockdale would receive the Congressional Medal of Honor for conspicuous gallantry while in a prison camp. At the cost of great personal agony, Stockdale created a dangerous prison underground and established a code of conduct among fellow POWs that frustrated the North Vietnamese. His goal, survival with dignity. From the time I, I pulled that handle and was in that parachute, I was, I was committed to several things, and coming home alive was one of them. Stockdale was an only child with limited physical aptitude, but he learned to make up for his small size with sheer force of will. I said, I am not going to be a sissy, and I am going to make the football team. At the urging of his father, Stockdale entered the Naval Academy at Annapolis the class of 1947, where he would once again have to prove himself. One of his classmates was the future president, Jimmy Carter. The yearbook noted that James Earl Carter rarely studied, but was still at the top of his class. Of Stockdale, it said that he worked hard and played hard, adding it would be a lucky man to find himself on the China station with stock. In my mind, I was the world's best fighter pilot. I was a man of modern technology. I, I really loved my work. I will, in all honesty, say that I preferred to be out there flying combat to anything else. The Gulf of Tonkin, 1964. Stockdale is assigned as Crusader Squadron Commander on the USS Ticonderoga. Tensions with the North Vietnamese are at an all-time high. Reports reach the Ticonderoga that North Vietnamese PT boats have attacked the nearby American destroyer. Stockdale's Crusader Squadron goes into action, and Stockdale himself sinks to the end of the vessel. After news of a second PT boat attack, President Johnson orders American planes to bomb bases in North Vietnam. Now there is no turning back. But let no one doubt for a moment that we have the resources and we have the will to follow this course as long as it may take. Reporters interviewed the leader of that first retaliatory airstrike, James Bond Stockdale. The, the uh, coordination was worked out. I was able to see the planes uh, as uh, we approached the targets and uh, the, uh, the attack from a professional aviator's viewpoint. Uh, could uh, hardly be improved upon. Within six months, America would embark on a bombing strategy of unprecedented magnitude. At its height, Operation Rolling Thunder would involve over 12,000 missions per month, with pilots often flying through intense anti-aircraft fire. Stockdale's next assignment was to the USS Oriskany, a key carrier in the Rolling Thunder plan. By now, he had more flying time in the supersonic F-8 than any man in the world. This footage was taken by Stockdale himself on a bombing raid. Stockdale earned the respect of his men by refusing to sit behind a desk when his required number of missions had been met. We flew the attack aircraft with us. Uh, he was not one to sit back and let somebody else carry the load. He did his share and then some. Captain Harry Jenkins served under Stockdale on the Oriskany. He would later share a cell with him in a Hanoi prison camp. He seemed to have an insight uh, into things that other people didn't have. Uh, for example, uh, on our way to Vietnam, uh, he got all the pilots together and he went over the code of conduct with us and made it very plain that if any of us went down or shot down, that the code of conduct would apply. September 9th, 1965. Stockdale, a little tired, makes final preparations for what was to be an important bombing raid over North Vietnam. In less than two hours, his plane would be shot down. He was 41 years old and would spend the rest of his 40s in tiny prison cells, wearing leg irons and enduring the infamous torture rooms of the Hanoi Hilton prison camp. This is Hua 
Lo Prison, Vietnamese for Fiery Furnace, later nicknamed the Hanoi Hilton by the POWs. James Bond Stockdale spent nearly eight years in leg irons here. More than four years of that time would be in isolation. It became obvious after a while of, of living alone that if you didn't want to become an animal, you had to organize your life in some way. Now, this may seem like a, a strange thing to be in a little bit of a box in a pair of leg irons and, and, and to organize one's life, but I learned to do push-ups and leg irons. These were traveling. I, could, I did exercises, and I, of course, I had a ritualistic period in the day when I prayed, and uh, that became kind of a, an obligation. While Stockdale learned to cope with life in prison, his fellow pilots from the Oriskany continued Operation Rolling Thunder. Harry Jenkins was flying two missions a day until November 13, 1965, the day his plane was shot down. He too was brought to Wallow Prison, where he experienced the same system of torture that awaited all new arrivals. Well, they tied me up in such a way that my uh, my limbs, my arms lost all, uh, all the blood. My hands were uh, dark, had turned dark. The fingers wouldn't move when I moved them. Uh, my legs were in the irons, uh, waited to cut my ankles like uh, a pair of scissors. Uh, and they just left you to hurt. After four days of brutality, Jenkins finally broke down and gave his captors information about his missions. Only then was he transferred to the main cell block. Racked with guilt over being broken, he discovered that Stockdale was in the next cell. He was the first person who was able to get in touch with me, contact me after I was thrown in with the group or, or in a different cell block. And when I told him that I'd been broken and this sort of thing, his words were, welcome to the club, which uh, told me so much that I wasn't alone, that I wasn't going to be shut out, that, uh, that uh, he understood. It was extremely dangerous for prisoners to actually speak to one another. Instead, Stockdale taught them a tap code that dated back to the Civil War. He used this code to issue orders and direct the actions of the prisoners. You throw out the letter K, and you've got a 25-letter alphabet. If I put a C where K should be, the guy's going to be able to figure out what I got. A is 1-1, one, one. and I know that 4-3 is S. To get uh, practical about it, we had to have a call-up. We soon learned uh, that the best way to call up an American was to give him a very traditional American si uh, signal, which is the shave and the haircut. What do you do when you hear that? You rush the wall and you go, two bits. So that was natural. So if I were going to talk to the guy at the other end of the building, I could probably raise him by a big thump with the heel of my hand and if, uh, if he was alert, and it was during a quiet period, I would hear back. If, on the other hand, I had access to the peephole, I could see the shadow under the door, I knew where the guard was, and I wanted to talk surreptitiously and rapidly to the man next door, I might have the convention of using the cup even for that, because we could tap, and then I'd get it back. You know what I just sent him? Hi, H-I. And then he would give. And then I would say, R, the letter R, U, okay. We would communicate sometimes just for the sake of communicating. Uh, when there was a, a new guy would come in, we'd get his name and so forth and what the war was going on. And we had people who, having...